Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 154, and for this one, we're playing 510 on the Strip here in Las Vegas. Make sure to stick around to the end because I'm going to be going over my favorite poker books. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Last session was smooth sailing, and we won 4,400 in cash. Plus, we got a tournament victory, but there's always a calm before the storm. Can we make it through unscathed, or will the ancient curse of Winter's Tilt get the best of us? We're about to find out what this dark and gloomy night has in store for us. We roll into Bellagio around 3 a.m. We buy into the 510 game for 1,500. Let's do this. Early on, we're dealt ace-king suited under the gun in a shorthanded game. I open to 30. The player on my left calls. The button is a very aggressive opponent. He three bets to 170. This is the second time that he's three bet me this session. I had to fold the first one. I'm glad I have a real hand to stick with here. I four bet to 600. I'm more than happy to get it in against the button. The middle position player folds. The button gets caught, trying to pick my pocket. He folds as well. Nice little pot to start out with and win without seeing a flop. Ace King suited is a cool hand, but pocket aces is even better. We pick it up in middle position. I open to 30. The cutoff calls. The small blind calls. The big blind has this look in his eyes like he's right about to give me a lot of money. Three bets to 140. He's a different dude than in the previous hand, but the big blind definitely likes to three bet a lot as well. It's awesome that I'm picking up monsters in these situations where I can fight back, not only to win pots immediately, but the rest of the table has no way of knowing that I keep getting dealt strong hands. They may think that I'm a maniac that loves four betting and they'll stop three betting me when I have more marginal hands. Anyway, I four bet to 350. It's not that large of a sizing. I didn't want to flat, giving the cutoff and small blind good odds to join in, but I'd like the big blind to at least call. We both have plenty behind, so he could potentially five bet bluff if he believes that I may be four betting light. The opponents all fold. We win a good chunk from the big blind, who I believe is mostly South African. He could have some French in him though, because he's quite good at surrendering. Next, we've got pocket fives on the button. It's a straddle pot. The cutoff limps in for 20. He's trying to get a discount on a one-way ticket to Pain Town. That's not gonna work. He's gonna have to pay full price, just like everyone else. And that price is 80. The small blind really wants to go and is fine paying. The under the gun straddler who three bets a lot, including that first hand against me with Ace King, just flats for 60 more. I imagine that he has something weak. Cutoff folds. Three of us are seeing the flop. There's already quite a bit of money in the middle. It comes king, queen, four with two spades. It checks to me. Third pair isn't great, but I'm the only one that can have all the sets, aces, and top top in my range. I fire for 150 to take a stab at it. The small blind will have a lot of small and medium pocket pairs. The under the gun straddler will have lots of hands that don't connect either. This bet allows me a chance to win immediately with the worst hand sometimes and denies equity from hands that have six or more outs. Both players fold. Not a lot of resistance so far. We're up about 350. Here we've got King Jack suited in the big blind, under the gun limps in, the hijack calls. No need to reopen this pot and make it larger when I'll be playing the rest of the way from out of position. I check. Three of us are involved. The flop comes Queen 10 9 rainbow. We've got the nuts. I check. Under the gun throws in 30. The hijack folds. I don't like slow playing straights. I raise to 100. Under the gun doesn't like slow playing whatever he has. He re raises to 230. I know I said that I don't like slow playing straights. Still, I don't want to scare him off if he's somehow bluffing or tried to be sneaky by limping in with aces under the gun. I call. The turn is the ace of hearts. It'd be amazing if he has aces or ace queen. I check with plans to get it all in on this street if possible. It's not possible. Under the gun slows down and checks back. The river is the king of hearts. Terrible card because there are four to the straight. I'm not exactly sure what to do in this situation. I don't want to check and have all hands that I'm beating check back. I bet 500 to make it look like I'm trying to steal it and get a crying call out of a set or two pair combo. The player tanks for over a minute. He's considering paying me off light. He ultimately folds and shows a queen face up. He's a nice guy. I show him I had the straight. He'd later tell me that he had queen 10. Very bad run out for that hand. Perhaps I could have gotten it all in against him on the flop. Oh well, we're up 500 and we're not stopping. I pick up king queen suited under the gun. I raise to 30. The big blind has a short stack. He defends. We're heads up. The flop comes 6-5-4, all spades. We've got the king high flush. The big blind feels like that's a good one for him. He leads into me for 70. He only has 175 total. I go all in. He doesn't take long before he calls. We're battling in another interesting spot. The turn is the deuce of hearts. The river is the eight of diamonds. Turn over my hand, expecting for it to be best. Then the opponent shows his hand, which is never good news because he's not required to do that unless he has the winner. Indeed, he does not have the winner. He has 7-6 offsuit. He flopped top pair with an open-ended straight flush draw, then river to straight. 
we take a five minute break to call the floor over, who brings out the rule book and confirms that flushes beat streets at least between the hours of 3 and 7 a.m. All of the opponent's chips are immediately converted into Bradley dollars. We're up 800 with plenty of poker left to play. In this one, we've got pocket tens in the cutoff. Under the gun opens the 30. I call, the button calls, we're going three ways to the flop. The dealer puts out 7-5 deuce rainbow. Under the gun checks. My over pair isn't likely to get any better. There's only one card that I'll be happy about hitting. I make it 60. The button calls, he's been playing somewhat tight. It's alarming that he's sticking around. Under the gun folds, we're heads up. The turn is the ace of spades. Not great because I'm no longer beating hands containing the naked ace of hearts. I check, the button doesn't seem to be concerned that I haven't beat. He bets 85. Getting a good price, something just doesn't feel right. I don't like calling out a position when I could be drawing dead or may only have one out. I fold, the button is a nice guy and a vlog watcher from the Aloha state. He shows ace six of hearts for the nuts. Oh, I the ace on the turn was a better card than I thought. We get away without much damage done. A few orbits later, we have jack eight of diamonds on the button. It's a straddle pot. I raised a 60. A new player named Anthony from Houston sits down. He's a principal and track coach. As soon as he took his seat, he put me on his Snapchat and said that he wasn't gonna play any hands with me. Well, that was a bluff because he calls my raise from the small blind with only 340 behind. This could be a trap. I'll be playing cautiously. I thought you said you weren't gonna play any hands with me. Yeah. <laughs> We're heads up, the flop comes 666, all devil faces. Small blind checks, I check back. The turn is the 10 of hearts. The opponent checks again, maybe he doesn't have anything. I check back. The river is the five of diamonds. Small blind checks once more. He probably has ace high or a small pocket pair that I could potentially bluff him off of. There's still some tiny chance that he has something he'd call a bet with. Mostly, he just seems like the nicest guy on the planet, so I don't have the heart to fire. It's gonna be tough for me to win. Anthony from Houston, Texas, principal, track coach. You got me. Nice time, man. Nice time. <laughs> it's tough to have a more infectious laugh than that. Meanwhile, my stack is going the wrong way. I pick up queen jack offsuit in the hijack. Under the gun, plus one, post 10. I raise to 40. The button calls, the big blind calls, and under the gun, plus one calls. We're going four ways to the flop. It's jack 10, three with two diamonds. We flop top pair with some backdoor draws. Checks to me, I don't love this spot. I bet 90 to charge anyone with a drawing hand and or overs. I actually don't mind checking here against three other players. The button folds, the big blind calls, under the gun plus one folds, or at least heads up. We could be up against a number of holdings that we're ahead of. The turn is the seven of diamonds. The flush draw gets there. Nine eight makes a straight as well. The big blind checks, I'm not firing. I check back. The river is the ace of hearts. King queen gets there. Any hand containing just the ace of diamonds has us beat two. The big blind bet's 140. It appears to be a blocker bet. I'm getting about three and a half to one on a call. I only need to win around 30% of the time to make the call profitable. She could have jack eight or jack nine. The problem is those are about the only hands that I'm beating. She might not even bet those. I call anyway. The opponent takes me to value town with king queen for the straight. I'm disappointed in myself for calling there. I've slowly been bleeding from the high point. I'm barely winning now and would be tilted if this went from a solid winning session to a losing one. It's time to rack up. By the way, the whole beginning part about storms and ancient curses was just fake foreshadowing. Luckily, we didn't get wrecked, but I bet some of you thought we would. I just have to keep you on your toes. Played for four hours, I won $115. I was up 800 at the high point, and then I stopped winning. So uh, I could tell I was getting a little bit frustrated and I wasn't playing my best anymore. There was that call at the end with Queen Jack, and I realized after that I don't beat anything, so it should be a pretty easy pull. And the more I was thinking about it, kind of the more mad at myself I was getting. So uh, I figure, probably just good to book a small win. If I had gotten stuck after being up, you know, 800, then I would have been even more frustrated. So, seemed like a good time to go. It's also really pretty out at this hour on the Las Vegas Strip. Time to, time to head home. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons because it helps out the channel quite a bit. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. 
and uh, be sure to hit the notification bell. I mentioned in the beginning that I was going to go over my favorite books, so these are in no particular order, but uh, you know, since I since I got into poker at the age of about 15, I've really been interested in, in reading these poker books, and uh, I've accumulated quite a bit over the years. Um, I think as far as strategy goes, training sites are, are better these days, but uh, there's still a lot of knowledge in these books in particular that um, I think you can draw from. Anyway, uh, the first one here that we're going to go over is Ace on the River uh, by Barry Greenstein. Awesome book. There's a ton of really, really cool pictures. It's not so, it's not so much strategy based, but there's a lot in here um, about navigating the life of a professional poker player. Goes over, you know, the traits of good poker players, things to avoid in the in the gambling world, and uh, much, much more. Check that one out, especially if you're an aspiring poker professional and you're, you know, on the younger side. Uh, the Godfather of Poker. This one is a fantastic book about Doyle Brunson's life. Uh, it talks about all these old gambling stories and just. As a, as a big fan of the game, it's cool to understand the history of poker and it kind of goes over the World Series of Poker and it talks about uh, Vegas when the mob was kind of running it. So all, all these really, really cool stories. Um, this next one that we're gonna go over, shit, I don't, actually don't have it, is uh, Treat Your Poker Like a Business. I thought I had it with me here, but it's by Dusty Schmidt. And that one, as the name suggests, just talks about taking poker seriously as a profession, and uh, there's a heavy emphasis on bankroll management, which is super important, obviously. Um, but uh, there's a there's a little section in there by Jared Tendler, who was Dusty Schmidt's golf mindset coach, I believe. And uh, then Jared Tendler wrote his own book called The Mental Game of Poker, and this helps you overcome tilt and a variety of other kind of uh, negative things that can affect your play. So check this book out, really, really good. As far as strategy goes, um, anything by Ed Miller is fantastic, but this one is what I recommend to almost everybody. Um, it, it talks about how to exploit players in 1-2, 2-5, and 5-10. Marvin wants to make a cameo here. Buddy. All right. Just do whatever you want. Okay, uh, I highly recommend this book. It's just very easy to read, very interesting, and if you're you know, losing a break-even player, I think you'll get the most value out of this book. Uh, from there, you can go to Poker's 1%. This book is a lot more advanced and talks about uh, optimal frequencies that you should be betting and calling and raising and all that stuff. Um, I've never read another strategy book like this one, so super good. Uh, pick those up if you're interested in learning more about the poker world or improving your game. I think you'll get a lot out of them. Hope you guys are all doing well. Good luck at the tables, and I'll see you next time.